All right, we're going to go, go ahead and get started today. I want to thank uh, uh, those who are in attendance uh, to the webinar. appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, join us today. Uh, today we will be talking about security risk assessments and user awareness. Um, we'll have another, uh, Lee's going to be joining us here in a few minutes. He's usually my teammate on this. He's, uh, he does have uh, his kid home with him. Uh, she didn't be feeling well, so I know he's got uh, responsibilities with her, but uh, we are going to be recording this webinar. Um, it will be online to our YouTube channel, um, so please uh, check it out there if you can't attend the entire uh, presentation today. Uh, there are also many other of our webinars uh, saved out there, so if you happen to miss one in the past, uh, then you feel free to go back and uh, watch that uh, if you can. So uh, <clears throat> today's topic is security risk assessments and user awareness. And I really want to start out by just sort of reading through an article uh, that I, uh, I found, uh, you know, posted on the No Before blog. Um, you know, it says, uh, you know, 60% of organizations are hit by cyber attacks, generally spread by their own employees. Um, when you think of cyber attacks, the assumption is that it's a simple matter of the bad guy sends an email, the user gets fooled, the user clicks malicious content, and the badness happening happens. Uh, but that really doesn't tell us, you know, how and why the attacks are still successful. And I think that leads into the risk assessment part of our topic today is that uh, on average, the adversary may sit within a network for up to 150 days. Uh, before uh, they actually either initiate an attack or begin exfiltrating data. So uh, that's why it's very important. Uh, these, that's why we've chosen to put these topics together uh, in this webcast because they are related uh, to some extent uh, that the user uh, understands the threat vectors, but also that your network uh, and the assets on the network are correctly configured uh, you know, to combat any kind of uh, persistent threat that may exist there. So, um, as always, if you have uh, any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A bar in Zoom. Uh, I try to answer those as we move forward to end the webcast. I don't like to wait till the end. So, if you have a question about something we talk about or a subject, feel free to put it in there and I will try to get it addressed during the webcast and that way we can uh, maybe be a point of discussion and there may be others uh, online who may want to uh, have that same question. So feel free to uh, put that in there as well. Um, our agenda today, we'll be talking a good bit about security assessments. So I'm gonna try to split up the webcast equally between these two topics because they are both equally important. And uh, we'll talk first about security assessments. Uh, and then also go into user awareness and education and why it is so important. And then we'll have some time at Q&A at the end. Uh, we generally go 30 to 45 minutes. This one may be a little bit longer today, just depending on questions. But also uh, these topics are pretty uh, deep and there's a lot to unpack on each one. So when we think about a security risk assessment, you know, if I were just to, to find that, uh, I found this definition by the SANS Institute, which I think fits very well. Um, it's basically for perform to identify uh, the current security posture of your information system within the organization, provides recommendations for improvement, uh, allows for organization to reach a security goal that mitigates risk, and also, uh, and also enables the organization to put a plan in place. So when we generally, when you look at an assessment, uh, you know, you're, you're taking you know, pieces of your environment and you're taking the security around those pieces and comparing that against a known standard to really identify gaps that may need to be filled, uh, you know, for various reasons. Uh, you know, some of the common reasons we see, uh, you know, for these security assessments, I know Lee and I have done quite a number of these over the past uh, year or two, uh, and we have seen uh, the number of these assessments grow exponentially. And these are some reasons we see them happen uh, one is just for compliance reasons, uh, you know, HIPAA, PCI, FISMA, there's also some state laws that require entities to uh, go through the security assessment or risk assessment process um, as part of compliance. Uh, we are recently or most recently dealing with a client who is a financial service provider uh, and they do business in New York and New York has a pretty stringent 
compliance statute in place uh, that is directly related to cybersecurity. So it requires them to have a risk assessment done. Uh, it requires them to have, you know, things like multi-factor in place. Uh, it requires them to have vulnerability management, acquires them to have a security awareness program. So a lot of things, uh, you know, like that are required for them to do business under uh, that statute. And, but a lot of times they don't know exactly where they stand as related to that statute. So that's where an assessment comes into place. So we can help them determine what gaps they need to make or fill in order to meet compliance. Uh, most of the time is organizational with the cybersecurity concerns. Uh, I, th I don't think we can go uh, through a day or a day or two without seeing some kind of news about cybersecurity, uh, how it's affecting an organization. I know some of the most recent ones, uh, you know, at least around this area, especially in Alabama, where the city of Florence, you know, got hit with ransomware. Uh, and so people read those articles and then they begin to look internally um, at their own business and they see that, hey, that could just have easily been us. Uh, you know, and we could have had to pay out that several hundred thousand dollar ransom to get our data back if we weren't prepared for that. So uh, I always tell uh, clients and those that I talk to about cybersecurity that you need to put security on the agenda or at some point it will become your agenda whether you're ready or not. Uh, organizations that have experienced a breach or cyber event, unfortunately, sometimes uh, you have to go through the experience of those events. Uh, to make it for cybersecurity to become a priority. And a lot of times uh, we have come in behind, uh, you know, a client that has either been infected by ransomware, they've had some kind of breach or, or some kind of event happen. And they're like, hey, they would really woke them up. And they realized very quickly uh, that, hey, we really need to get on top of this. Uh, we dodged a bullet. Uh, you know, we were very lucky. And then we need to take some action now. And usually the security assessment is that first step. And then finally, third party requirements. Uh, I know as a managed service provider, we get, we are probably, we are asked, uh, you know, about how we handle cybersecurity within Abacus. And, you know, we're obviously prepared to answer those questions. I'm surprised we don't get asked about it more often than what we do. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of, we're starting to see that, especially more on the GovCon side with the introduction of CMMC, which is a, the next generation of the NIST requirements that now those government contractors are looking to anyone they really do business with, third parties, and they also have to have an assessment done and meet certain uh, compliance requirements. So that sort of helps set the stage about our discussion about, hey, what is an assessment and what are some reasons that we see uh, for these assessments to take place. Well, how's it going to help you? Uh, you know, and that sort of builds on the previous slide. You know, one, by having an assessment, it helps you maintain regulatory compliance. You know, assessments just show the way you, your security posture at a single point in time, uh, but sometimes you have to have those continually year after year after year, uh, but it will help maintain regulatory compliance. If you are uh, there are regular, you know, we talked about New York, Massachusetts, both have state laws related to assessments. Uh, we're also seeing the insurance data security law in Alabama uh, is requiring uh, more stringent regulations on insurance providers where they also must go through an assessment process and also improve their security posture. Obviously, if you're, a, you're part of HIPAA, FISMA, or any of the other type of regulated industries, uh, you have to have an assessment or you know, have your systems tested on a, on a regular basis and uh, in order to probably continue doing business uh, because if you don't meet those compliance, a lot of times you could face fines, fees, or they will just uh, not allow you to conduct business. Uh, it helps you assess your current security posture or security provider. Uh, we do get called in sometimes to go behind either an internal IT team or an external provider uh, just to give an objective point of view um, you know, about the security of an entity. And, and this is extremely important, I think, from my standpoint, because cybersecurity is such a diverse and deep uh, subject. And, you know, as many years as I've been involved, as many years as Lee's been involved in, in technology and even security, you know, there are still some things that we don't know. And, and there's still some approaches and, and, uh, in, in, you know, settings and configurations and thought processes that maybe we haven't been introduced to. Yeah, uh, tool, tool sets also, you know, those are always revolving, finding new tool sets to, to do things with. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we've been working uh, on one assessment here recently, and, and there's another third party we brought in to help us with that. And, and he's brought some, you know, tremendous, he works with a lot of NIST 171 companies out of Huntsville, and he's brought a tremendous amount of just knowledge of, hey, here's how we do it. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I'm glad we had this conversation. So, uh, you know, I think it's good that as a, you know, we, we like to work with, with other security providers. We like to work with other MSPs. We love to work with internal IT, you know, to help improve security posture, you know, at organizations. But, you know, it also helps you assess that because I'll tell you, we, we work a lot of internal IT, man, day to day. They're just going after it, you know, keeping the business running, keeping customers, ha keeping users happy, uh, you know, keeping systems up. And sometimes security is not something they uh, have their eye on on a day-to-day -day basis. They do what they can, but not always what they must. And that's no fault of them, but it's just the situation they're put in. Um, so we, we see that happen a lot. That, that's a great way to, hey, what is your posture? Uh, you know, and sort of, you know, where can you improve? Because that's really what this process is about. It's about improving. Uh, obviously, it can help you experience or prepare a real cybersecurity incident without disrupting business operations. Uh, Lee, you got any thoughts on that? Because I know we've been through a couple incidents here right, lately that we've faced. But, uh, you know, how do you think assessment help, helps prepare a client, uh, you know, for the real incident? Well, there's a lot of preparation goes into it, even to, you know, the degree of uh, response plan. Uh, very important that everybody's organized when the incident does happen, that they have an organized methodology to, to, to tackle the tasks. Um, even before the incidents, having, um, you know, we provide usually a long list of remediations and those go directly to, you know, to help with and if there ever was an event, hey, whether, how, how do you recover from it, via backups or uh, addressing the public or your staff. So um, the remediation list we provide in, in our, in our um, audits is very helpful to when and if an, an incident actually ever hits. Yeah, I would say it's always easier to find those gaps before the incident and let not let the incident find those gaps for you. Because uh, generally, if that happens, you know, your your business is down and then, you know, you're sort of in a mode where you've got to recover at that point. It makes it very difficult. So I'd rather find, you know, those gaps now than have an adversary find them for me. Um, documenting existing security controls. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we just don't know what the security looks like and that we, we see that a lot with clients that we work with. They're just like, I just don't know what controls I have. You know, I don't know what network devices I have, you know, inventory is something they just don't have a record of. <clears throat> they really don't know how their, their keys to the kingdom are being uh, protected. They don't know what their account security looks like. They don't know what their firewalls look like. So an assessments provide an amazing vehicle to get that stuff documented uh, where you can actually have a, a piece of paper that says, hey, here's how you're protecting your, uh, you know, your privileged accounts. Here's how you're uh, protecting your network perimeter. Here's what your backup process looks like. So uh, a lot of times, you know, it's really hard to start improving if you don't know what you have and where it is right now. Um, identify exploitable flaws. One of the things we do and like to do as part of our assessments, of course, is vulnerability scan. So we do internal and external vulnerability scans and management for clients. So it helps us identify, you know, exploitable flaws in their network. It may be a vulnerability of an old system you have in place. It could be a firewall port that you have open. You don't need to have open. Uh, it could be your auditing. So you may not be able to detect uh, certain events that happen on the network like it should be. Uh, and maybe you don't have uh, your antivirus deployed across the organization like you should. So assessments will help you identify those items. <clears throat> and, you know, those are what we say. When I say gaps, those are the gaps that I'm talking about. Uh, you know, we, you know, every, a lot of times we deploy networks and we deploy network devices uh, with the, the function in mind, with the, uh, you know, that's what it's out there to do the business side of mind, we don't always just simply deploy it because, uh, you know, and think about the security when we deploy it. Uh, align the IT risk management business goals. Uh, you know, this is a big one. Uh, you know, every business has an inherent risk associated with it. You know, if you're in healthcare or you're in the financial organization, you have data that's valuable to someone and that data 
the fact that you house that data or you transmit that data brings risk, you know, into the IT environment. So you really have to find ways to align, uh, you know, your business goals with your IT to make sure everyone's on the same page about, you know, the changes that need to be made, the investments that may need to be made, and also about, you know, it, about how users, you know, are should interact with that information, the policies and procedure side. So, uh, you know, having this assessment helps say, hey, well, here are the risks in my organization. You know, does that align with the business goals? If it doesn't, let's get it aligned uh, because that way you have uh, the corporate management and the IT team working and rowing in the same direction. And, and also just smarter decisions about your technology. <clears throat> Assessments are great to help you determine, you know, what changes in technology you mean, may need to make. Uh, we do see some very unique technology that's deployed across industries and in certain environments uh, that, you know, that is inherent because of that environment. You know, if you're a <clears throat> department retail store, well, you're going to have, you know, uh, you know, you know, card readers there. You know, if you're in an industrial environment, you may, may have to have SCADA machines. Uh, so there, there's always technology uh, that may be specific to different industries. And, you know, maybe an assessment can help you make smarter decisions about that because maybe help you say, hey, we got flaws in this particular platform. Hey, we're thinking about moving to this other platform. Well, it doesn't have the same flaws. Is it better? Is it going to increase your security? So, you know, all these things are, are great benefits of the security assessment and how they're going to help you out, uh, you know, both, both, I think, initially, but also in the long term. So I want to talk a little bit about scenarios. And, and what I did is I went back and looked at, you know, many of the clients that we've done these security risk assessments for and tried to say, well, these are the scenarios that usually have kicked off an assessment or have, you know, brought, you know, an assessment to the forefront of something uh, that a client wanted to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit through uh, through these just as an example, because I'm hoping that, you know, hey, maybe someone uh, may associate or may relate to these scenarios and we'll also talk through why, you know, an assessment was important in these different uh, different areas. You know, one, we have client A that recognizes that cybersecurity within their organization should be a priority, but they just don't know where to start. Uh, that's usually one of the, the primary reasons we see a client get an assessment because they come to us, they say, hey, I know I need to have security. You know, I know it needs to be important in my organization and it's not now, but I just don't know where, where to start. You know, I don't know what uh, security controls we have in place, what is being done, what is not being done, and I need help. So that is probably the one of the, I would say, most common scenarios that we face. Uh, Lee, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to mention, too, that um, they don't know where to start, and this is with companies with existing IT staffs or without <laughs> IT staffs. It doesn't matter. And one thing to keep in mind is, you know, it's not like we're going back behind the IT staffs to check their work or let them know what they're doing or not doing, but it's more working hand in hand with that staff to um, address any issues that they might not have the skills for, capacity to do. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody uh, watching this is in, in the IT field, but capacity is usually one of the biggest yeah. problems that we all face. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the day to day, Kind of takes over the higher level security overview of a company. So we see a lot of them that have IT staff and they're very talented people, but they just don't have the capacity to do it. And we go in and work hand in hand with uh, with them to to help gather more data and um, see what we can find, what maybe uh, maybe uh, neglected overall. Yeah, and I think one of the things we've seen working with a lot of internal IT and other service providers is they sort of know what needs to be done. You know, they, they understand that, but sometimes, like you said, they just don't have the capacity to put those controls in place. And and, and a lot of times I'll say, I would tell them it's 80 to 90% of the time when, you know, as far as starting the security program, doesn't take a huge investment in technology per se. A lot of times it is, hey, just using what you already have access to configuring it in a way where it provides more security for the organization. So yeah. I think yeah. that's something we've between, seen a lot of. Between that, you know, using the tool sets that in, inevitably are already mm -hmm. provided to them to the max, uh, you know, capability, capabilities of security and 
the stuff also, don't forget about the stuff that IT can do, but more or less that corporate policies can do also. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, if you're a company looking and you just don't know where to start, assessment's a great place to do. That's, that's probably the best, the best step you can make right now is just, hey, you've got to have that starting point, and assessment's a great place to find out where you're at and, and where you stand because if you don't know where to start from, you're not going to know how to move forward, at least not effectively and efficiently. Uh, you know, the second scenario is client being, you know, provides professional services. They have experienced significant growth through mergers and acquisitions. So we recently did a, a security assessment, uh, you know, on a client who had grown significantly through M&A activity. And, uh, you know, we found that, you know, there is an inherent risk built in, you know, to M&A uh, with cybersecurity. A lot of times, you know, the, you know, when two companies merge, you know, there's a big focus on trying to get systems moving, get people productive, get cultures aligned. And, you know, sometimes security is something that pushed by the wayside. Maybe they don't think about that as much. And so that brings an inherent risk into that process. So, uh, you know, if you're a company who is looking to purchase or merge with other companies or acquire other companies, doing, including cybersecurity as part of your due diligence uh, would be extremely smart and, and needs to be a big part of that process because you really don't know what you're what you're bringing on you know when you start you know integrating their systems and their networks and their assets into yours uh you also could be integrating risk vulnerabilities and even existing breaches uh into your own network yeah and and again too that goes right back to just because the company grows whether through mer merger or acquisition doesn't necessarily mean that the it staff grows and, yes. and they got all these other problems to bring on and take care of and be concerned about uh, just, again, capacity uh, to what they can do. So just keep that in mind. And then client C, uh, experience to breach, system or compromise. Uh, clients were, you know, effective financially. I think this is one of the scenarios we talked about where, uh, you know, they, hey, something happened. You know, it was bad. It caused a problem. And, uh, you know, now cybersecurity is on the agenda, whether they want it to be or not, and they need to find out what their systems look like and, and, and where the security for those systems and what place is it in. Uh, maybe even help do some forensics to find out how the systems are compromised, uh, but also look for other threat vectors that may exist. We've seen that happen through our assessments. Uh, we work to clients who may have had breaches. Uh, they know the breach came through one direction and one threat vector, but then when we came behind and did an assessment, you know, we would find a threat vector that was totally not even on the radar for them. They, they, they had realized, you know, hey, well, this is how the original breach came in, but hey, you didn't even notice, hey, there's a whole other threat vector out there that was totally missed that we caught during the assessment that could have led to another problem down the road. So, you know, if you, ex you know, if you experienced a breach or you've had, a, you know, cyber events in, in the past, you know, an assessment is a, is another good way to basically see where your systems are uh, to make sure that there are no indicators of compromise, but also make sure you've got all your threat vectors covered. Uh, client D uh, recently terminated a key member of the IT staff. Uh, we've, we've worked out one before, I know. We've had, we've had to deal with that in multiple situations. I know you've had some personal experience with doing some of that. Uh, you know, you want to talk to a little bit on that one, Lee? Well, I, I'll just say this, that that's probably the most common one, us being an MSP. When we replace another MSP, you basically have to go through and do this and try to make sure you remediate all the ways that that previous MSP or IT person, for that matter, had access to the system remotely um, or physically for that, for, that, um, for that reason. Yeah, so you know, whether it's being internal IT or maybe uh, you're replacing service providers, you know, we always do a security check as part of our onboarding process just to evaluate this the, the basic security items. Uh, an assessment would go much deeper than that, and maybe that you had a key member leave. Uh, maybe they knew about everything how it was configured, and you re and you're now in a position where uh, that was cranial cranial knowledge, and it wasn't transferred properly. And now you're not sure what you have and where it's at and how it's secured. An assessment will help you get through that process and at least create a baseline for you to 
uh, you know, make another hire, bring another service provider, but also make sure your network is secure until those changes take place. Uh, and then finally, uh, client E, you know, they must meet compliance because of regulatory obligations or they are a third party service provider. I know we have seen this working with several law firms in town. Uh, they get um, RFPs uh, and many times to participate on cases. And I will tell you this, RFPs are heavily weighted with security. Uh, and uh, we have to respond to some of those. We have to help our clients respond to those. So, and I think this is something we're going to see down the line even more that if you want to do business, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, a, a business, especially one that may have regulatory obligations, you better have your house in order for security. And if they're required to produce documents showing uh, security, well, you need to have that, that prepared as well. Uh, so we have seen, hey, these, these risk assessments help identify and help you develop your security program as well. Uh, we've helped the clients do that before and say, you know, here's the things, you know, what is your password policy look like? Why? Well, I, I don't know. Is it documented? No, it's not. What is your incident response plan look like? Well, we don't have one. What about backup, backup disaster recovery? We don't have that documented. So at some point, you know, your clients are going to be asking you for that information or maybe even your vendors. And if you can't produce it, then that could cost you business and cost your ability to uh, conduct business, you know, with those vendors or even clients. So uh, regulatory obligations are going to continue to get pushed down the line. Uh, we're seeing that in GovCon already, but I think we will see that more uh, in, in other regulated industry like financial services, uh, insurance, uh, you know, any kind of wealth management, those type of companies as they, as the regulations tighten around them, they're, they're fine. They're going to have to make sure they only connect business with providers they can also meet those regulations as hey, well. So, hey Brian, when, when yeah. doing, when, you know, we deal with a lot of compliance when doing these. What would you say are like the three requirements that you know the whole umbrella of all these uh, compliance um, organizations or, or protocols? What are the three that are most common that we cover in in our audits? You know, I would say you know the top three in my opinion is one we're going to talk about security awareness training. I think that's one of the biggest concerns that we've seen in these audits because we, we've gotten these requests too. Uh, they want to make sure you have a good security awareness program going with your users because, you know, your employees are, uh, you know, the biggest threat vector and the most common. Um, I think you've, you've got to have good documented policies and procedures because uh, to me, uh, that tells me if, a, if I go into an assessment and the client has these things documented, then that I would want to say if they've taken the time to document them, then they're in order. You know, that they, they've got some organization, they've got some uh, mechanisms and processes behind the scenes. They're, they're making sure these are working. Uh, and, and then finally, I would say, you know, I think authentication is probably the biggest one. Uh, you know, password policies, lockout policies, um, policies related to access to certain systems or security groups, you know, having multi-factor authentication in place, you know, I think those are some of the big ones that we're seeing, uh, you know, most interest in, uh, you know, before, you know, it's like everybody focused on the firewall, but now everybody's working from home and really those other two become a bigger factor when you're working from home. Uh, you know, I'm working from home today. I don't have a corporate firewall, uh, this blocking anything or protecting me, but you know what is, you know, I am the firewall. The user is the firewall. You know, I'm the last line of defense. Uh, you know, my authentication on my machine, the multi-factor authentication I used to log into my applications, those I think have come to the forefront uh, in, in a lot of these inquiries about, well, what are you doing with your client, your employees now that they're working from home? How are you protecting your organization? How are you protecting, you know, this business relationship we have that we have to have a compliance for? How are you doing that? And I think those are some of the things I've seen. Uh, come to the forefront. Do you have any other thoughts on that or any any that you, you think more than others? You know, I think logging is a big one that we see yeah. a lot um, that a lot of people aren't doing. It's really tough to collect and store logs, and that's the reason why people don't do it. But I think logging would be another one we see a, a lot across all platforms. And log, yeah, retain, no. log retention. Yeah, I mean, we worked with, um, you know, we, we ran incident responses two weeks ago for a client. Uh, they had gotten uh, infected by ransomware, uh, lost about 1,700 files during that process. But uh, when they called us, they, you know, sort of explained the situation. You know, one thing we're looking for is, well, 
what kind of logs do you have? <laughs> logs either on the endpoint, logs in the endpoint protection, on the firewall, and, and that helps you know, that helps really orchestrate a response, but also determines, well, how did it happen? You know, because that helps determine how to stop it as well. Uh, so uh, that, I think I agree with that. Logging is a big one. We do see that as a requirement on almost all of these RFPs, any kind of compliance, hey, you've got to have the right kind of logging turned on. And it's also when we see, when we do these assessments, always is a deficiency. Uh, either it's not turned on, or uh, the client doesn't have a process. They don't have a you know system event monitoring system in place to to house that logging. Uh, we see it big time in Office 365 that hey, you've got to go turn the logging on 365. It's not turned on by default, uh, so you have to go turn some of that logging on just to make sure uh, certain uh, events are being uh, you know recorded. So you can have something to go back to if you do have a problem at some point. Uh, just, I know we talked a good bit about our, our risk assessments and sort of give you an idea of what our risk assessments look like. Uh, we have two, really two versions. Uh, we have what we call rapid risk assessment. Uh, so it is a more or less, uh, you know, uh, we use the top 20 trivial controls. It only measures 43 sub controls. So uh, you can go to the center of internet security. You look at those top 20 controls. We love the top 20 because it's really easy to communicate and help you and help clients understand uh, you know what kind of controls they need in place uh, if you go to NIST or you go to some of the other uh, you know standards out there you know you're talking about going through 25 families and each of those families have hundreds of controls to talk about and that that conversation usually is very tough to have with clients that are just starting out in cyber so uh, we have adopted the top 20 controls um, and it's done this really well uh, so our rapid risk assessment, we look at 43 sub controls. These are the most basic sub controls, uh, you know, for cyber hygiene, uh, you know, that we look at. We do an external vulnerability scan. We'll give you an executive summary uh, with identification, quantification of current risk, uh, an actionable and prioritized roadmap for remediation. Uh, just showing you the risk and the vulnerabilities does you no good. Uh, you need to have some, a plan of action, and someone needs to prioritize that based on the risk it brings to the organization. And also, we do phishing simulations as part of these assessments to help uh, test your user awareness and education. Uh, the next step up is our full security risk assessment. Uh, this covers 140 subcontrols. Uh, we do external and internal vulnerability scanning. Again, provide that executive summary report, uh, you know, identification, quantification risks, and then give you that same plan. Uh, prioritize the roadmap remediation and not services. So uh, if you're looking, uh, you know, if you're one of those, you know, clients we talked about that, hey, I just don't know where I am, you know, the rapid risk assessment may be the best place to start for you. If you're someone with more compliance driven, uh, you know, your, your business is more compliance driven, then the full security risk, risk assessment is something you should probably look at. Uh, you know, as far as if you're looking to have one. So, but that's how we, uh, you know, we go out and talk to clients about, you know, the types of risk assessments we do uh, for them. And we have done, uh, you know, I, we've seen a number of these assessments, uh, you know, I think almost to the point we're almost doing one a month, uh, sometimes two a month, just depending on, uh, you know, business and, and different companies that we uh, come in contact with. So let's talk about user awareness. Uh, you know, we have about, 30 minutes left today, but, uh, you know, think before you click or download. So I found this, this graphic in a, uh, in a recent survey that was done, but just in businesses, the challenge, you know, what are our goals and what are the challenges related to user awareness and education? Um, you know, I think as leaders, our top goals, you know, to get, you know, culture of security is, hey, we want our employees to be aware of their responsibilities. Uh, we want them to understand that, uh, you know, their behavior and practices, you know, we want security behaviors and practices naturally adopted throughout the organization, and we want them to follow a security policy. Uh, so these are these are top goals in leadership that we, we see and want to have to have that culture of security in the organization. Uh, and I see these three as very pivotal. Uh, if employees aren't aware, then, uh, you know, they're not going to do a good job of, of trying to, to do secure things online. Uh, you know, if they don't adopt the security behaviors and understand why they're adopting them, 
then they're going to present more risk to the organization. And if you don't have a good policy in place, uh, it's going to be hard to enforce that. You've got to have your policies documented uh, across the board. Uh, so this goes into the challenges. Uh, you know, basically employees don't view security as their responsibility. Uh, we often hear the phrase that security is an IT issue. It's really not. It is a business issue. Uh, a lot of times, uh, there are <laughs> most of the times we see uh, phishing emails happen, they're not sent to the IT staff. <laughs> they're sent to the CEO. They're sent to an executive. They're sent to the secretary. They're sent to the, the controller. They're sent to people in the organization that are not in IT. Uh, so you got to have employees engaged because – Security is, you know, their responsibility, and it should be everyone else's in the organization as well. I tell even my staff, I'm like, hey, you, you all need to know, uh, you know, how to support systems and program firewalls, but you're all security engineers, always. Uh, we all have to be security engineers in, in everything we do, you know, in our business. We can never, uh, not we, we can never ignore security implications of things that we do with clients and their systems. Uh, the second challenge there, employees don't take time to get smart on the security policies. Uh, this is a big one, uh, time management. Uh, we've only got so many hours a day we want to and can devote to our positions and our jobs. And, you know, now you're telling employees they've got to watch a video about security policy. Well, they may not want to do that. They may want not want to take the time uh, to get smart on that. And that's always a challenge is getting people to participate uh, in these education seminars or education portals. Uh, you know, employees feel like security impedes on their productivity. Uh, this is a big one uh, as well because a lot of times you have to balance security uh, with convenience. Um, it's not convenient to have a 16-character password. It's just not, especially when you got 25 of them to remember. Uh, does it increase security? Absolutely. Is it convenient for productivity? Probably not. Um, is it convenient for every time you log in that you have to have your cell phone there to, you know, approve that login through a multi-factor authentication? No, it probably isn't. Uh, but we have to make and help our employees understand uh, that, you know, what they do and how they do it, you know, contributes to better securing the organization. Don't change the password because the IT staff tells you to. Change your password because you know you're doing your job to help secure the organization. So. So these are some top goals and top challenges I found, and, and I think these are this is very representative of the challenges we see, you know, across the clients we work with, especially with when it comes to user awareness in education. And, and keep in mind too, you know, we got all these tools, whether it be firewall, antivirus, you know, name the tools. Those are nice and dandy, and the bad guys know that they're hard to crack unless you just yes. have a blatant flaw in them. Um, but your end users are the easiest thing that'll just give them a pathway in with a couple clicks or providing a password, they'll give them some level degree of access and they know the end users will give it to them. Uh, so those are your biggest targets and that's why you see all these phishing emails and uh, yeah. you know, half the stuff comes through uh, phishing emails or uh, false links and, but you know, that we're all targets, all end users and your C level people, or targets, you know, your end user, your financial people, they're all big targets. And yeah. They can do some a simple social engineering to find out your role at your job. And trust me, they're they're gonna they're gonna try to take advantage of it. Yeah, and most of the adversaries we see that that are successful, they're not sitting there like you want to think in a hoodie, you know, in a basement hacking through your firewall. That's not how it happens. All they're doing is seeing a password reset email. It looks like something you'd get from LinkedIn to all your users. Yeah. And, and, and then somebody clicks on it. And they're not just targeting, you know, your work account either. The last one that we had was most likely came through a personal email yes. account that they checked on their corporate machine. And it was, they got hit with ransomware. It got the machine. They took the machine, put it on the network. And it got, like Ryan said earlier, about 1,700 files in the matter of, you know, an hour. Before, yes. you know, luckily we discovered it or they discovered it early and uh, we got involved and were able to, to, to stop it. But I mean, it's just that quick. And, it, it, and you yeah. know, that started with nothing that was even work related other than they were checking their personal email on a, on a corporate machine. Yeah. And that's something we've seen uh, come up as a topic in, in many forums is, 
uh, you know, now that people work from home, they're taking the machines home, you know, where do you draw that line on personal use versus work use of a, a maybe machine that, you, that you've sent out? Uh, it does bring risk into the environment. So, I mean, if you, you're accessing your email, your personal email and Gmail, whatever it is, it's just as risky as that corporate environment. Uh, it may be even more risky because it may not have the security around it it needs to. Um, looking at, let's see, next slide here. <clears throat> looking at, you know, two things uh, I think are very important is building a culture of security in an organization. Uh, this helps reduce the overall risk. Uh, you know, you know, you want your employees to share a common vision and values on security. Uh, you know, this is, you know, not an easy thing to do always. Uh, sometimes it can present some significant challenges, you know, within your organization to, you know, get that common vision, get that values. And the third, I think employee buy-in is critical. And I'll tell you what's the most critical component about employee buy-in is the leaders of the organization have to represent the culture of security as much as anyone else. So if you're the CEO, if you're an executive, yes, you need to change your password. Yes, it needs to be a strong password. You know, you got to show your buy-in, you know, across the board, uh, you know, if you expect your employee to buy in, buy in as well. Uh, and you've got to represent that vision. You know, you got to show those values on security because, uh, you know, as a leader, you know, you need to set the example. Uh, you know, in the organization for security, you probably already you know exemplify that in many ways as far as culture. You know, maybe it's work-life balance. You know, maybe uh, you know whatever your culture may be, uh, security needs to be a part of it. But you have to represent that. Uh, you know, well, why do you need security awareness training? And when we talk about security awareness training, I know we uh, we utilize a platform to provide that training. We'll talk about that in a minute. But security awareness training helps you confront the bad guy that's trying, you know, that's trying to fool you at the, right that point in time. Uh, you know, you're getting a face-to-face -face confrontation there with the bad guy through that email. And you want to make sure your uh, employees have the awareness and education to confront that threat uh, when it's presented to them. Like Lee said, phishing emails are the biggest problem we see. Uh, you know, detect scam emails and take the appropriate action. Uh, that's extremely important to be able to know what the triggers are, you know, for those emails, to know exactly what to look for, uh, you know, uh, how to look for it, you know, and, and making sure they can identify, uh, you know, those scam emails. And I'll tell you, they are really good at it. I've seen some really, really good emails uh, that are out there that are total scams. I get sent a lot of them myself. Uh, so I, I get to build a, a quote unquote library of these that I keep uh, just uh, just because I like to reference them. I like to use them in examples and presentations, but I also like to um, duplicate them for our fishing simulations. So, uh, you know, as, as part of our assessments, we do fishing simulations. And, uh, you know, sometimes those simulations are not just your run of the mill. Hey, you've got a UPS package that has showed up or something that we generally see. But uh, in one situation, we actually did more of a customized phishing attack where, hey, Lee and I went out and did recon on this company. We said, well, what does this company do? You know, what are they into? Uh, you know, we, we're able to find all their emails on their website. Uh, you know, we're able to, to look at their social media to see what kind of events they were a part of or associations or groups. Uh, we're able to, look, to harvest all their information from LinkedIn. God, and that was, the, that was what we chose. I mean, uh, out of, I think, 65 employees, like 50, 55 to 60 had very, very well thought out, well published LinkedIn profiles. So you know what we did? We published and created a little LinkedIn uh, password reset email. And we used that as part of our assessment in the phishing simulation. And I think what is like 50% better than 50% clicked on the link, I think. So yeah, I think it was uh, like 53%, just over 50, uh, 50%. Yeah. And and the ones that didn't fall for it, you know, they, they said, well, you know, they were smart enough to recognize, hey, I don't have my corporate email attached to my LinkedIn account. So I knew it was fake. So that's the kind of awareness. That's the kind of education we're looking for, uh, you know, through these awareness programs is to get your get your employees to think like that. You know, to saying, hey, something's not right here and, you know, and not just take action immediately. So 
uh, you know, don't ever, you know, th there's a lot of like really run of the mill phishing emails, but man, if you get to a situation where they're really targeting you and they're using either recent events, you know, associations you're in with or, or some kind of like LinkedIn or something like that, uh, it can get really dangerous really quick. And keep, uh, in, mind, know, keep in mind too, they do this social engineering. Let's say, okay, ooh, I did get the, their password for LinkedIn. Uh, guess what? They're going to go try to use that password on your email account too, or any other yeah. login you might have. Right. So yeah, if they, you know, when you compromise uh, an email account uh, and they get your credentials, they're going to try to use those credentials somewhere else called credential stuffing is what they call it. Uh, so when we look at sort of the, you know, I, I guess the educational timeline, you know, I have to ask, where do you think your employees are? You know, are they, uh, you know, are they at that lack of awareness? They have that unconscious incompetence. Uh, I, I don't know that I don't know something. Uh, and we do see that a lot. And you may see, uh, you know, usually where we see clients begin, uh, they, you know, they don't, a phishing email, you know, what is that? They may not know that. Uh, you know, then they become aware. You know, they're conscious that, hey, there's a threat out there. You know, I know that there's a threat. I'm aware of that threat, but maybe they can't recognize at that point. Uh, they're at that awareness stage. I know that I don't know something. And then now we see to building that confidence. You know, I know something, but I have to think about it as I do it. So I see a lot of clients are somewhere between the awareness stage and the step-by-step -step stage. So a lot of clients, we still see employees that anything they see online, any email they get, they trust it which leads them to click on links and do things they shouldn't do, uh, you know, through their email or, or through a malicious website. You know, we generally see a lot of clients sort of stuck in that. I know something, but I, but I have to think about it as I do it. That means they see that email and they have to think about it for a minute, you know, that, Hey, you know, well, should I click it? Should I not click it? Um, you know, this looks odd about it. Maybe it isn't odd about it. You know, what do I do at that point? Uh, they recognize the threats there, but they're really sort of thinking through that process in order uh, with that to take that next step. Uh, and at that point, your education really comes into play there. They're aware of it already, but are they educated enough to say, hey, I'm not going to click on that link or maybe I will click on that link. Uh, you know, that's the point where education is going to take over and your culture is going to take over. And then finally, you know, the skill stage. I know something so well that I don't have to think about it. Um, I relate this back to, you know, the bank teller. They don't teach bank tellers how to identify counterfeit bills. It's just way too difficult. You know, there's too many different ways that someone could counterfeit a bill. What they do teach them is they teach them how to recognize the bills that are good. And I think that's where we have to be at, at that stage with our awareness and security. Uh, we have to be so good about it. And we see an email, we immediately know it doesn't look like a good email, you know, you know, we have that kind of awareness. We don't have to think about it, that we can automatically just know, uh, just unconsciously uh, that, you know, hey, I didn't request this email. Hey, I didn't request at least send me a file. Or I know our voicemail system is not through, uh, you know, this phone company. Or no, you know, I did not request a password reset from LinkedIn. You know, I don't, didn't recently order anything from Bora Bora. Uh, you know, the, all these things come into play as far as making a conscious decision, but also making an unconscious decision about not to click, you know, on a link. So, you know, you may find, uh, you know, your employees spread across all of these different stages right now. And, and, and honestly, that's not uncommon. Uh, but I think that's where having a good awareness and education program helps at least accumulate them or puts them on the right direction where they can, you know, move up this chain of competence. Uh, you know, over time and as you present the education to them. So uh, knowing where your employees are very important because uh, it also helps you with their risk. So, you know, we uh, we utilize the uh, No Before platform. We have a lot of clients using that. It's a very well-known and common platform to use to educate employees. Uh, allows you to uh, basically conduct phishing simulations on a regular basis. It also presents them with a lot of what I think is good topics uh, that they can use for uh, education. It's not just specifically on phishing emails. It's also about, well, what about insider threats? What about banking fraud? What about, uh, you know, what about smishing or where you get, uh, you know, phishing emails through text messaging? So it covers a wide variety of different scams 
and security risks out there. It helps educate the users on how to uh, develop awareness, but also educates them about it. Uh, but if you're looking at putting a program in place, you know, these are some things that we always recommend to clients and want to recommend to them uh, regarding their own security awareness education program, whether you're using our product or if you've got your own product, there's several out there in the market. You know, I think there's some important key points, and we'll end with this today. But one, frame the program with a positive tone. Um, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we're just, hey, we're trying to trick you. Uh, that doesn't help the situation and doesn't make the client feel good. I mean, didn't make the end user feel good about what's going on, uh, but you're not just trying to trick him. You want your program uh, to be seen in the light that you're doing, trying to do something good for the organization and employees within it. You're trying to help them be more educated and be more aware of the threats out. It's not just about tricking the employees. Uh, it's easy to trick employees. It, you know, you can, you can develop all types of emails to trick an employee. Uh, the more time you put into it, the more de deliberate you are with it, you're going to eventually trick them. But that's not the point. Uh, we want to have a positive tone with our awareness and education that, hey, you're part of the team. We need you to be part of our team, and we need you to con contribute to the overall uh, success and security of the organization. That's the message we need to have in our programs. Uh, we need to be intentional about the post week landing pages. Um, this is important because if someone fails a phishing simulation, well, what happens next? I've seen several things happen. I've seen, uh, you know, some goofy picture come up and say, hey, we got you. Uh, you know, I've seen the Rick Roll come up. You know, I've seen cartoons happen. You know, I don't think that's the right response. You know, when when a client clicks on a link and uh, that's a, that's the most critical moment you have with that user uh, to educate them. And now we're seeing, hey, we're seeing, you know, with no before we can take them right into an education on, hey, here's what happened. And here's why you need to be more informed or be educated. Use that post click as a learning moment, not a moment to tell, tell the user, hey, we got you. You tricked us. We own you. Whatever, you know, message we want, you know, may want to send across. So that's not the point of an education program. Uh, that's the learning moment. And you got to capitalize that on it capitalize on it as much as possible uh, if they do happen to click on the link. Uh, empower them with the new behaviors. Uh, you know, we provide our clients with that fish alert button. So that way they feel like they have to do something about that, you know, that email. They don't really know what to do about it. Uh, we're, we're telling them not to click on the link, but let's sort of replace that behavior with by giving them an alert button where they can report it. And, you know, that not only helps your better informs your IT team, but it makes them part of the process. Hey, you know something? I received something bad and I reported it. You know, I'm part of, I'm doing my part to help inform our IT staff, inform our security team about the different threats we're receiving because, uh, and we've seen this happen that, you know, we'll get several different emails, uh, you know, reported to us as fish and we know that they're coming from one address or maybe they're one, coming from one IP. You know what? As a security team, we can go block that IP in the firewall or we can block the destination of that link or we can block that domain. We can take action, you know, that could affect and protect the entire organization, you know, that, that you're part of. So just by reporting that uh, you're already doing your part, but also I know offense informs, I mean, defense informs offense in that standpoint. Uh, measure and train at their individual competency, train for improvement. Uh, Everybody is different in your organization. There's always going to be, uh, you know, different age groups, different cultures, different individuals. They all need to be trained. Uh, all have different competency, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, being aware and also identifying scams uh, and security issues. So uh, it's okay to, hey, you need to address that during your program or have a way to address it. Uh, I know Nobu 4 does a great job of it because if you're an employee that, hey, you, you fail the first phishing test, well, you're going to be subject to more training and education in the future. And it sets you up for that. You can take them down a track where, hey, there may be just people that need more education, uh, you know, about what's going on. And now if you have an employee who never fails one, uh, well, maybe they don't get as much education as that other person did. So you have to look at, you know, if you can have a way to measure that competency but also react to it, uh, then I think it will definitely help you have a more successful, pro more successful program. And finally, fishing frequently. Uh, a lot of times we see clients just do, hey, I fish my people once a year. Well, all you're getting is a baseline with that. 
uh, you're not really getting a full picture of their security across the organization. Uh, I've seen uh, recommendations to fish as, as, um, as soon as every two weeks. So, you know, your users are constantly being bombarded, uh, you know, with some kind of phishing email. So you can constantly be aware of their education and their awareness. And then, you know, I think we do, I think I've set up our program at least every month, maybe every two to three weeks, you know, we fish our own employees alongside with the education program we have. So it's something that uh, we have to put, we have to put these simulations, you know, in front of our employees very frequently and, and very often, uh, you know, it can be just a one time year, two time a year, because you're really not doing a good job of measuring their educational awareness level. Number one, employees change. You have headcount that moves up and down. People leave the company. People are hired on. Uh, you know, it's more importantly, hey, what if you can do it one group, one one every two weeks, a group another two weeks, you know, find whatever works for your organization. But, but fish them frequently. Find ways, uh, you know, put this in front of them continually, uh, you know, more often than not, uh, just so you can see the patterns that develop over time. So, so these are some things that I think are good recommendations for you to consider um, as part of your own security awareness program. Um, obviously, our team is here to help. So uh, if you need help, uh, maybe you're interested in having a security assessment. Uh, you know, maybe uh, you're interested in, in establishing a security awareness program. Uh, you know, we're very experienced in doing both of those items. Uh, some of those fall under Lee and myself, you know, we conduct a lot of those assessments, just me and him, uh, you know, with clients. And we also help them put up the security awareness program. So uh, if there's something we can help you with, please get in contact with us. Uh, we've got to, to continue the conversation. Uh, you know, if, if anything, just sit there and talk to you about, you know, what are you doing for security in your organization? Uh, you know, just tell us what you're doing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having those conversations. And the more conversations we have about security, uh, I think the more and more informed we'll all be with that. So uh, I didn't have any questions or any Q&A come through and leave it open for just a few more uh, seconds. So if you ha did have a question uh, that you would like us to address or answer, uh, feel free to put that in the box now. Um, if what not, about, uh, what about password keepers? Had somebody ask about a password uh, keeper and uh, are they good <laughs> tools and uh, should they be using them? And if so, what, uh, what, uh, uh, yeah, I, I believe that. Uh, yeah, I, I believe password managers are a great tool. Um, I think that's something all organizations should consider uh, supplying to their employees if they can, or at least encourage the use of them. Uh, I would say password fatigue is some, is a real problem. Uh, as we reuse passwords or use certain patterns in our passwords, uh, the adversary is always after credentials, always after credentials, and they know that. If they can compromise those credentials, then uh, they usually can access the system or data uh, that will benefit you know themselves. So uh, I know I use uh, Keepers when I've used. Uh, I know another organization uses RoboForm. They really like that one, uh, and I think another one like LastPass is one uh, that I've used too. There's several out there. I think the biggest thing to remember when you're using those is uh, you know to make sure whatever database they stay in or stored in it is encrypted. Um, it's not a plain text database where someone could steal that file and therefore steal your passwords as well. So, don't see any other questions out there. I want to thank everyone. Is, you got one more? Okay. Would you? Yeah, have? I was going to ask. You know, they were asking if uh, advocates could do uh, a fish, you know, without the training, just to see what their baseline is, to see if they they need training. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's part of our assessment. Uh, we can do fishing simulations by themselves uh, to get a baseline of where your employees are and the type of education they may or may not have. So we can definitely help out with that as well, uh, that we've done that for several clients uh, because they, they may not have a program in place. Maybe they've never fished their employees, uh, but we can definitely help them with that. You got anything else for me, Lee? You see anything else? All right. Well, uh, again, uh, we have recorded the webinar, so uh, information will be available on YouTube uh, within the next uh, couple of days. And then uh, you can re-watch re uh, the webinar if you choose to, or maybe you can share it with someone in your organization uh, to keep informed. So um, 
thank you for attending. I really appreciate uh, your attendance today and your attention and the questions. Uh, just remember to put security on the agenda before it becomes the agenda. And these are two ways uh, through an assessment and a security awareness program you can do just that. So hope everyone stays healthy. Hope everyone has a great day and a great week and a good fourth. We'll talk to you later. Thanks.